right, everyone. One of the most promising aspects of the way that we're thinking about AI today is a deliberate focus on human AI complementarity. That is looking at ways that AI can complement rather than replace human intelligence. This idea has become so important that some, notably uh, Gary Kasparov, who I interviewed three years ago on the show, have proposed redefining AI as augmented intelligence. Today, I'm joined by Dan Bohush and Siddhartha Sen of Microsoft Research to explore two very different projects that they're working on that both connect to this theme. Welcome, Dan and Sid, to the podcast. Uh, thanks for having us. Um, nice to meet you. Thanks. It's great to be here. Uh, before we jump into your individual projects, I'd love to have each of you share a bit about your background and how you come to or how you've come to work in the area of human and machine collaboration. Uh, let's get started with you, Sid. Yeah, so my background is generally uh, as a distributed systems researcher. Um, and I joined Microsoft Research after uh, graduating uh, with my PhD. And I was focusing on systems research, but because I was surrounded by a lot of people working in artificial intelligence, I slowly started to incorporate artificial intelligence into the work that I did. And then I realized that um, we don't often have a great balance between the kind of um, work that the AI does for us and the work that we do using our human heuristics or our human designs. And so I became increasingly, inter increasingly interested in that intersection between AI and uh, human design working well together. And that's one of the reasons I've been moving towards this space. So instead of trying to replace our human solutions with AI, trying to find the right synergy in different contexts, whether it's algorithms or data structures, or games like chess, trying to figure out the right balance between when we can use AI at what it's good at and when we can use our own human solutions at what we're good at. And so that's been an increasing interest of mine in recent years. Awesome. Dan? Um, yeah, so um, I uh, basically the, the questions that drive my research are um, how can we get computers and computing systems to um, uh, perceive and reason about physical surroundings and collaborate with people in physical space. So how can we have much more human-centric collaboration going on when we when we interact with computation? Now, how I got here, it was kind of serendipitous ro route, and um, I, I have a deep interest in language, and um, that started in um, my undergrad years when I was doing um, computer science, and I was looking around for opportunities to get more engaged in research. One of the assistant professors at the university I was at was um, working on building the resources that you would need to start building a speech recognizer for the Romanian language. This is back in Romania, where I'm originally from. And so I got involved in that work, and I, I, I started working on natural language processing. Um, and then I went um, to graduate school, where I worked on spoken dialogue systems. Um, back in the early 2000s, these were telephony-based systems, but it's the same kind of technology you have in, in these voice assistants these days. Um, and I was looking at problems of how do you get these systems to know when they don't know, to understand that errors might be happening. Speech recognition was not that great back in that day, um, you know, and kind of behave more like humans. We, we sometimes um, have misunderstandings with each other when we interact with each other but we're able to quickly and gracefully recover from those. We're monitoring for mutual understanding and we're, we're able to recover from these errors. Um, and so from that, I, I, uh, after graduating, I joined uh, Microsoft Research, uh, where I am now in this um, adaptive systems interaction research group. And um, when I joined in 2007, this group was um, actually led by um, Eric Horvitz. I know you had a recent uh, interview with him, which is, by the mm -hmm. way, it was great to listen to. Um, and Eric was my manager at the time, and he's the one that actually kind of spurred me on and, and encouraged me to almost like broaden the frame of mind from thinking from, you know, voice only interfaces to how might we one day be able to build computing systems that reason about people in physical space and interact and collaborate with them uh, with language or in other ways, but with the fluidity that kind of characterizes Human human interactions. Um, so that's kind of what I'm passionate about and what drives me and what I do these days. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I think this uh, theme of kind of two very different approaches and, and backgrounds uh, with some commonalities is something that we'll be seeing and speaking a lot of in this conversation. Uh, 
let's kind of transition to having each of you dig into your individual projects and um, kind of set the stage for a broader conversation around the this theme. Uh, Sid, let's go back to you and have you share a little bit about Maya. Yeah, so um, one nice thing about the labs that Dan and I work in is that we're surrounded by a lot of different disciplines. And in some sense, that influence has uh, found its way into my work. And so I'm surrounded by social scientists, by artificial intelligence researchers, by people who study ethics of machine learning and its role in society. And so, you know, a lot of these um, influences have kind of come together in this project uh, that we call Maya, where we're trying to really take a particular kind of system, which is the game of chess, and try to make it more oriented towards humans. And it's interesting to look at chess because chess is often a precursor to a lot of AI research. It's often a playground and a model system where you can try out and test out different ideas in AI um, before you try them out in more complex or more realistic domains. Um, one of the reasons it's really nice to work in chess is because it's very self-contained. We have clear rules. It's still a very challenging game um, to, to solve. And uh, people still play it despite the fact that you know, humans have been outperformed by machines since, uh, you know, since Deep Blue defeated uh, Kasparov um, back in the day in 1997. And, you know, definitively, we have AI that is superhuman uh, in the sense that at this particular, in this particular context, in this game, it can uh, defeat the strongest players in the world. And so what we wanted to do was instead of having the situation where there's AI that just beats humans all the time, can we reorient that AI towards humans to try to understand how humans play and to help humans develop and grow and learn chess in a better way. And so the Maya project is trying to do that. We are taking state-of-the-art AI engines that are good at playing chess, and instead of training them to basically win the game, we're training them to understand the decisions humans make and try to understand them at a very individual level. Like what would a player at this level do in this situation? Or what would this specific player do in this situation? And the goal is that by understanding and, being, and doing a good job at predicting uh, those decisions, we can get a better gauge of the strengths and weaknesses of humans at different levels of individuals, of specific individuals, and, there, and therefore um, suggest ways in which they can train or improve themselves to get better at this game. So that's essentially what Maya is. So Maya is a chess engine that predicts human decisions at different levels and can even predict the decisions of individuals if we've trained on enough of their games in the past. So that's another nice thing about chess is that all the games that you play and all these online forums are public and available to us so we can take them and learn from them. Um, I think the larger agenda and vision of the Maya project is to start with chess, but to ultimately um, develop teaching tools that can be combined with human teachers in the right way to help people improve their game of chess. Nice, nice. Obviously, no accident that I mentioned Gary Kasparov uh, yeah. earlier in the conversation. And uh, one of the things that he's been excited about is this idea of uh, a different kind of collaboration between humans and computers in the game of chess, um, using the computer as a uh, kind of augmenting the human in them playing chess. This is a very different approach where you're trying to uh, augment the teaching of chess. Is that right? Yeah, I, I think there there is an interesting connection there. Um, you know, there are different modes of chess where you can actually play with another person, advising in what to do, uh, team them up together, and even uh, play with an engine as well as a team. And so we're actually, actually exploring all kinds of collaborations. So similar to the ones that you spoke to Gary about. We are trying to see how these two um, um, entities can work together. And when it comes to teaching, I think that um, the AI engines that we've developed can be a great tool for someone who's trying to teach others how to play chess because it can help the teacher understand the weaknesses of the player to focus on the areas where they need to develop more. Um, and it can also recognize the player's game. So one of the cool things that our engines can do is they can, given a set of games that you've played, we can tell who played them, which to me hmm. implies a kind of deeper understanding that these models we've created have been able to achieve. Even though we don't fully understand what's going on inside these models, we know that they've somehow been able to recognize different playing styles. So what makes your playing style different from your playing styles? These models have somehow figured it out so they can distinguish different people from each other. And I think this is actually a really good teaching tool because 
to me, one of the good things that a coach or a teacher can do is recognize their students' work and understand their students' strengths and weaknesses so that we can better guide uh, the development of their or, and their learning process. Um, we are doing experiments now where we're imagining um, a collaboration between a human and the Maya engines in an actual chess game, which is more along the lines of what I think you're talking about, mm -hmm. um, Sam, which would be a very interesting kind of collaboration because if I was playing with someone who was way stronger than me and they suggested I do a move that I really wasn't capable of handling or understanding, I might mess up the game entirely. And so it's interesting to find the right balance. And this is something that I think Maya can do well. It can figure out, okay, you're at this level. Let me advise you to do this move in the game. Because if I advise you to do this really advanced move that a grandmaster would do, I think you're probably going to mess it up in a few moves from now. You know, and so understanding what level your partner is at is another interesting uh, dimension of this work, which mm -hmm. I'm really looking forward to exploring. And I'm imagining that in this case, level can be much more rich and robust than beginner, intermediate, expert. It's, I've seen exactly. you do these types of moves before. Uh, this is something that you could probably execute or understand. Uh, it's kind of just at the edge of you know what you might otherwise do so I can teach it to you. Yeah, exactly. And this is one of the nice things about chess is that there is a very well-established rating system called the ELO rating system that gives everyone a number. And um, you know this rating system is relative to other players that you play. But we've trained Maya engines for people who are rated at, let's say, 1,100, 1,200, 1,300, up to 1,900. A grandmaster's rating is about 2,500, and the world champion's rating is above 2,800. They call them super grandmasters these days. Mm -hmm. And so you have this very um, detailed rating system, and we can train models that are catered to different levels, even if they're only separated by, let's say, 100 ELO rating points. Okay. So yeah, you're right. I, was you're exactly right. That, yeah. I think I was uh, envisioning that the there will be a degree of learned personalization that transcends the uh, an ELO rating, like a not being a chess person, I'm envisioning mm -hmm. that, you know, two people with a 1500 ELO rating might have different strengths and weaknesses and lean on different moves and, and things like that. And the engine exactly. could be even more customized to their particular playing style than, you know, just looking at the number. Ah, I see what you're getting at. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, you're right. The, when we train these models to learn about an individual player style, um, they do learn some of the nuances and the kinds of moves that individual players will make. And you're right, the two people at the same level um, might be there for very different reasons. One might be stronger at the opening of the play. One might be stronger in the middle game. One might be really good at end games, or one might be really good at what they call tactics or you know, ways of maneuvering your pieces to get an advantage. So um, the, the Maya models we've created will try to understand the kinds of moves you'll make. And this is actually how they're able to distinguish your games from other people's games. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that you mentioned this point about being good at different things. It's a very, actually, a very deep observation, I think, because a lot of times people will play our bots, um, which we say, oh, we train these bots on moves played by people who are 1,500 rated players. And then they play the bot and they say, this is way stronger than 1,500 or stronger than 1,500. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because we're collecting the sum total of knowledge of people who are at 1,500, the, total, the totality of that knowledge is actually stronger than a 1,500 rated player. So if you put a lot of 1500 rated players together and they're good at different things and they got to that 1500 rating for different reasons, the combined wisdom of that group of players is actually something that's stronger than 1500 rated players. So that's one of the most common questions we get in emails. Like, why is this bot stronger than the games you trained it on? And it's exactly for this reason that you just mentioned, Sam. Right, it almost prompts kind of a philosophical question about the rating system itself. It does, yeah. There's a, and I think it's an interesting question about group wisdom and um, you know, and what people can do when they come together. Like, does that work? And look, when we've trained them with automated algorithms and data crunching, we can actually take that knowledge and I think use it in a more cohesive manner. If you put ten people in a room and ask them to play a game together, uh, which they sometimes do in chess, you know, I, there was a game, famous game, where Gary Kasparov played the world, where everyone could collaborate on the moves. Uh, together mm -hmm. and played against him. I actually don't know how well that works. That's an interesting experiment to run. I mean, you mm -hmm. want then you're talking about people who are coordinating and trying to make a decision together, and that's that's another uh, problem on its own. Awesome, awesome. Uh, Dan, why don't you introduce us to your project? 
Yeah, so um, my research work is in a different domain than Sid than chess, but it has the same kind of overarching theme, if you want, of like, how do we get computers to meet people where people are, right? In, in, in people's space where people find themselves. Um, you know, if you think about how we interact with computers today, the dominant mode still remains one that we had from the 70s and 80s where, you know, I sit down on a chair in front of a screen, I type on a plastic keyboard, I know all about files and directories and Wi-Fi connections, <laughs> uh, but the computer has no idea about me, about, uh, you know, my space and where's my attention and how do I behave as a human in the, in the social world. And so in my work, I'm looking at um, how how might we create systems that can interact with humans in physical space with the fluidity that human interactions um, have? Now, I'm particularly interested, as I mentioned before, in language. Um, and if you look at a lot of the language research that happens today, a lot of it is anchored in the written or the spoken word, right? Like we have machine translation, speech recognition, you know, document summarization. It's not a surprise that we equate language with, with text in some sense, because um, I think writing is such a kind of powerful cultural tool that we have. Uh, but if you look closely at how interaction actually happens between people in face-to-face -face settings, it's a much, much richer phenomenon that goes well beyond the spoken word. Um, we do a lot of things non-verbally. We coordinate with each other a lot uh, without realizing even that we're doing these things. Uh, how do I place my body and my shoulders relative to everyone else in a cocktail party group? Uh, where do I look and for how long and how, how long did my gaze linger, you know, here or there? Uh, the facial expression I have, head nods and head shakes, the prosodical contours of my speech, gestures, all of these things come into play to create, you know, the seamlessness that we have with each other. And the fascinating bit is that the, the richness of this process does not become apparent until you actually try to ask the question, well, how might I make a computer participate in that? You know, how might I build this computationally, you know? And then you realize, wow, there's all these, all these different things that, that are going on. So in my work, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to look at various ways of computationalizing, if you want, these processes um, and, and getting computers to understand the social physics of how we interact with each other. Um, I can give you an example, for instance, like um, think of how you take turns in a multi-party conversation, right? We have these voice assistants today in our pockets. We push a button, ask a question, get an answer back, right? There's this kind of turn-taking right. model where I speak something, something gets spoken back. And if I'm lucky, maybe there's, I can do a follow-up turn and some context is carried, right? Now, if you look again back to the dinner conversation, you know how to speak and when to speak. You know, you know the timing of when to speak. And um, you do that seamlessly and, and you actually use a lot of cues for that. So in our work, for instance, one piece of work we did is on uh, building models that let computers do inferences about not only when is speech happening, but who is actually talking, if I'm in a kind of group setting, who are they talking to? Who do they expect should talk next? Is it my turn to talk, right? So there's all these problems that come in before you even get to things like speech recognition mm -hmm. uh, that create the glue in human-human um, interactions. And we're trying to look at, can we get uh, computing systems to reason about these processes and participate in them more fluidly? Got it. My initial sense is that uh, on the one hand, uh, there's an element of these types of problems for which uh, uh, an AI, a learn type of approach is ideal, right? It's very much akin to in computer vision, you know, could you write down the rules for identifying, you know, a, a cat's face versus a dog's face in an image? No, but, you know, you feed enough data to a, uh, a CNN and it can do it pretty easily. So, you know, similarly, I don't know that I could write down the rules for turn taking. It's just something that we know how to do. And so learning that should be, ideal. Uh, on the other hand, um, knowing how to write down the question seems really hard. Like that's the right. Formulation of the question seems. That's really right. Hard There's case. a lot of, a lot of, it's funny that you mentioned that that's, that's exactly spot on. Like a, a lot of the difficulties we're having is almost in how do you formulate the problem? How do you reify these constructs? Mm -hmm. What is, what is the actual construct that I want to model? Sure. I can train something, but I need to first decide 
what, what is the representation I'm going to use? So we're, we're dealing with a lot of questions of, for instance, in this multi-party turn-taking model, um, representation questions. Do I represent, you know, one way to go about it is to think, okay, I'm going to represent uh, this notion of conversational floor. One of us has the floor at a given point in time, and I'm going to try to train a machine learning model to figure out who has the floor. But I could go differently about it. I could say, no, no, no. The way this process actually really works is that we each do floor control actions. So for instance, if you look in sociolinguistics and psycholinguistics and some of this literature in the space of human communication dynamics, uh, you'll find patterns. Like if I wanna um, you know, uh, give you the turn in a conversation, you know, I might end my sentence with a downward prosody and look at you, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas if I don't wanna give you the turn, I might kind of put some hesitations in there and look up and avoid gaze contact while I retain the turn because I want to formulate what I'm going to say next, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, so you have these patterns. And so then you can think, well, maybe I can model that. Maybe I can model, are you doing a floor release action? Are you trying to release the conversational floor? Or are you doing a floor hold action? But this question of representation and how do you represent these concepts that are kind of fuzzy and you know, nature doesn't come in boxes. We kind of have to put it in boxes to computationalized things, but I think uh, um, issues of representation are actually quite important. Uh, and then there's, of course, the dimension of, yes, a lot of these things uh, can be trained from data. You have to have the right kind of data. You know, it's, the problems are very multimodal in nature, right? There's, there's uh, both visual and audio, you know, signal in, in how we do this. Um, and then apart from the inference problems, you also have control problems, right? Because if you're, a, let's say, a social robot museum guide, Right, that, that really wants to interact, you need to not only understand what's going on, but you need to control your own actions. And that control needs to happen under uncertainty and also under latency constraints, under important timing constraints, because you, know, you cannot wait too long you know, to, mm -hmm. to keep things going smoothly. Um, so I think there's a space of problems you know, from representation to inference to control you know, uh, that all need to work well you know, to get something that, that, that really works. Mm -hmm. And you talk about this broad line of research as physically situated interaction. The in the robotics example, there's uh, you know the physicality of that is very clear. In the turn taking example, maybe less so. Is there a, a spectrum of physicality in the examples that you look at, or maybe another way to put that is how do you think of you know the physical aspect of these types of problems? Yeah, I mean. Um... In some sense, I think even in turn taking, it is quite, or the way I conceptualize it and I think of it, it is quite, I don't know if physical maybe is not the right word. It's embodied. It's an embodied process. Mm -hmm. When we interact with each other, we have all these affordances of embodiment. Like the fact mm -hmm. that I can mm -hmm. shift my gaze from A to B can communicate actually something. So that's, in my mind, that gaze shift is almost like a physical process, right? Like I'm pointing from here to there. Um, but certainly the space is, you know, so so I think often of embodiment, and I, I guess of the what are the affordances that embodiment cre creates, and embodiment does not need to mean anthropomorphic embodiment. You can sometimes create things that that convey meaning in a spatial or in an embodied sense without necessarily fully anthropomorphizing things or having robots that look exactly like humans and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, on, on this idea of embodiment, uh, I'm wondering, Sid and Maya, does to what extent does that come to play in your research? Your uh, systems are looking at humans and trying to understand. Well, you, you tell me the extent to which um, right. that that comes into play. Yeah, I think it actually, you know, Dan's Dan's work and Dan's platform and framework that he's uh, created are a great inspiration for me because I really want Maya to get into that direction. Right now, Maya has survived by studying data, a uh, public chess game data offline to try to understand human playing styles, strengths, weaknesses, things like that. But ultimately what I wanna be able to do is to be in a situation, like a situated environment where there's a teacher working with a student trying to teach them. And this is where a lot of Dan's work um, really inspires me because that dynamic is going to be very interesting. I can provide the teacher with all these tools. I can tell them, here are the weaknesses, here are the games they've played, here are the kind of moves they make. But then looking at that interaction, how does a teacher use that to help train the student? Is the student getting it? What are their different learning styles? These are some of the questions that I'm looking into now that are really forcing me to branch out away from my comfort zone and the disciplines that I've been trained in, as Dan is doing, branching out into other disciplines like education research, 
um, social, um, social science, um, psychology, behavioral decision making, um, to try to understand how that dynamic should look and how it should adapt to different learning styles, different teaching styles, and then ultimately, how do we measure progress? So one nice thing about chess is it's not so hard to measure progress. We have rating systems and you know, people can play games and we can, you know, we have a good metric for progress in that sense. But this dynamic between teacher and student, what's working, what's not working, um, that to me is, um, is, is definitely a, a very situated problem, a problem of looking at two humans you know, working together. And this is something that's fascinating me. We're really slowly starting to get towards those kinds of experiments where we're actually involving humans and trying to show that they're actually learning. And so all of these questions are coming up. And honestly, I think it's a much more challenging space to be in. I can't hide in my bubble of chess much longer. I'm gonna have to kind of break free and deal with the real world um, in, in the way that Dan's describing. And then Sid raises an issue that um, I'm imagining is quite challenging in your environment. And that is uh, kind of performance and progress measurements and benchmarking. Yeah. Uh, how do you how do you measure turn taking, uh, for example? Uh, I'll I'll be frank, it's a mess. So uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's really like um, um, it is challenging. I mean, like I've just mentioned, even the reification you do influences the, the the representation you use. You know, might influence how you how you're able to assess something. Uh, you know, how do you measure fluidity or you know kind of seamlessness in interactions? I mean. In a lot of these, you know, when you look in the human computer interaction space, um, you know, you can ultimately go to a metric like, you know, user satisfaction, or you know, you can you can ask people, you know, how how did this feel, or is was this experience better than that experience? You know, you you can get some signal back, but the signal is either it seems far at the end of a system that has many different components, and then the question becomes, well, what translated into that? You know, like. You know, how, how do I use that signal to drive improvements in my pieces and my components? Or you get a signal that's at the level of your component, you know, like the little box you build to make inferences about turn taking, let's say. And then the question becomes, well, but does a 5% improvement in that mean anything anywhere? I think the, the other challenge I, I, I think in the world that I'm in, and I, I, I think in Sid's world as well, is the interactive nature of things. Right. Um, there's been a lot of progress in the last couple of decades, you know, in many areas of AI where people have able to establish have been able to establish clear benchmarks and metrics, right? And you have these competitions and people escalate and build better and better and better. And there's a way to to evaluate and assess and measure progress. And you know, we might disagree about whether the blue score, you know, is really a good metric or you know what what the metrics are, but at least there's a way to measure. I feel in the interactive space, the problem gets more complicated also because the systems are interactive. And I think chess is the same way, if, or at least if you're talking about the interaction between a teacher and a student, right? Whatever the system or the teacher does, right, affects how the student or the, the other part, the, the user behaves. So you're in this kind of chicken and egg problem back and forth loop and the evaluation really, to do a proper evaluation, you really need to have a system that works with people and that you evaluate with people. And that's just costly. It's not as easy as sort of downloading a data set and, and you know, calculating accuracy. So I think you're hitting on evaluation is a huge challenge. Yeah. I think it's also, um, yeah, sorry. I, I, you know, that what Dan's saying is making me realize that this dynamic is also um, a very complex one for which the reward function is unclear. Um, when someone's teaching someone something, um, it could be that ultimately they, do, they gain from it and the rating improves. But they may have had a horrible time because it was a stressful experience. I'm going through this with my kids, you know, like, you know, they're going through intense piano lessons and other kinds of sports lessons, and maybe they're not enjoying it, but underneath the covers, maybe they are actually developing and improving. So is that the reward metric I should focus on? Or should I focus on their and happiness and their engagement in the process, you know, and, and their, you know, their ability to last through lessons longer. So these kinds of metrics and signals, I think are very multifaceted, multidimensional. And one of the things uh, you know, I try to do in my work is try to collect all of those signals so that later on we can, after the fact, play around with different kinds of reward functions that combine these signals together to see which ones are the right ones. If I just optimize for your ELO rating, sure, maybe that's ultimately what a lot of chess players care about, but you might not have a very pleasant process um, you know, um, of learning um, going through it. And in some sense, I think that, um, and this is something you mentioned earlier, Sam, about you know, AI being better or even well-suited for certain parts of it. I'm fascinated by this question because I actually think that 
AI can um, serve a role that maybe it might might be difficult for a human to serve well in some situations. Like you were giving the example of um, recognizing images or, or putting into words what it means for a cat to be a cat. Um, there are some things um, in the in the dynamic of chess and in other situations, I imagine, where an AI may be more suitable. You know, for example, the, an AI engine won't get impatient with you. Um, sometimes people feel more comfortable actually when they're working with an AI engine or doing puzzles online because they can make mistakes and no one's watching them, mm -hmm. right? When you're making a mistake in front of a teacher, I think that's a completely different dynamic than making a mistake in front of a, a, a robot or an engine or an AI or some online tool, right? So I, there's an interesting synergistic approach we can take here. I think we have to open our minds a little bit and think about um, places where AI can be better suited to some of the tasks and where humans can be better suited to some of the tasks. So I find, I think that's a fascinating question, Sam, and I don't have answers in that space, but you mentioned it and it is something I've, I've been thinking about and realizing over time as we're, as we're thinking about putting our chess work into a more situated environment, like the ones Dan is describing. Uh, we started the conversation talking about representations broadly and, uh, one of the things that your work has in common is, you know, in some ways the machine is trying to build a representation of the human and how the human learns and how, how humans communicate in this turn-taking example, how they learn in the, in the case of chess. Uh, I remember reading an article uh, or I read an article not too long ago, actually, that was uh, I forget the details, but it was about chess and the person was talking about this experience that they were having um, learning chess and then playing their their child who uh, learned chess. And he d described, there was an aspect of the experience that he described uh, as kind of, you know, he's not really able to articulate why a certain move is is clear to him now um whereas you know previously it wasn't clear to him at a prior level like it's just a whole new dimension of play that you know opened up to him you know based on achieving a, a greater level and <clears throat> i think that's tying into me is like i'm imagining the the the, the 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 state that we're trying to represent of a human's knowledge of chess is very complex and like how does a computer begin to build and model that um yeah yeah it's, it's, it's a it's a it's a interesting question um it's I, I think what you what you described is something that i've experienced myself because in the process of doing this chess research i've tried to improve my own game and um you know what i see at different levels um definitely changes as i understand the concept I now see it almost immediately. I see it in a position like, oh, this is not good, or I should do this, or this feels wrong. And um, because I'm obsessed with teaching, I try to put that into words so that I can explain it. And this is something that the AI engines that we've developed are not giving us. Like they're, they're, they're able to recognize and see these patterns, but they're not able to translate them into words. And I think that's one of the biggest problems with the way we use um, chess AI engines today is that they just tell you what the best move is. They don't really tell you why. And, and more important than that, they don't tell you why in a way that you can understand. Mm -hmm. Is the there why a for, to the explainability research uh, that we see in AI? Yeah, I think so. I think there is a, um, there is a lot of, uh, there's, there is a lot of potential to adapt some of the techniques that people have developed to um, explain what's going on inside models. Um, to dissect them, to understand which features contribute to which decisions or which data contributes to which decisions that could be relevant here. I've done some work in this space myself trying to connect um, decisions made by model to the training data that caused those decisions um, and trying to say, okay, these are, the, these are the reasons, this is the data from which that model derived that decision and to try to draw these connections. But there's still a lot of work to do in explainability research, but this is definitely something uh, I've become interested in more because I want to be able to explain in a better way why I believe that you're going to make that move or why I think you're going to do this or why I think you're going to make a mistake here. And if I could explain that better um, by poking into our models and understanding what they understand innately, then maybe I can um, advise or guide a, a teacher or a coach in a better way. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan, 
tell us a little bit more about how this idea of understanding the human experience uh, represents itself or uh, plays out in your research. Yeah, so I like we were discussing, representation is core. And in a lot of the systems we build, we actually, so the explainability aspects kind of surface almost in a different way, almost like in an embodied way. And I'll describe what I mean by that. But um, we, the, the, the models will be that are, are compositional and we put in the representation. So we don't have so much this black box problem, like, oh, I train something and I don't know what goes on inside of it, right? Because each of the models we have are, are you know, um, built on representations that, that we kind of understand. At the same time, there's a, there's a parallel problem almost, which is uh, when we interact with each other, we're very good at kind of state transparency in some sense, or we we're good at projecting, you know, mutual understanding and what we understand, what we don't understand. You know, you can kind of look at my furrowed eyebrows or, you know, my hesitation in my speech and get a lot from it. And, you know, for instance, in a tutoring domain, that helps a lot. Like Sid was saying, you know, like um, glue things and, and um, you know, uh, progress. Uh, there's a similar notion in these embodied systems. We did some interesting work at some point where we're trying to reflect the actual probabilistic uncertainties that the machine had internally in various models in facial expressions. Like, you know, if I if my vision tracker doesn't see you that well, maybe I can squint and lean forward a bit. This is in the case of a virtual mm -hmm. avatar that sits on a screen and tries to interact with people. Uh -huh. You know, or uh, we had a, a, a little one of these now direction robots uh, that, was, that was giving directions in the building. And, you know, people are curious. Sometimes they would approach it and get very close to it, thinking that if they get close and speak louder, it'll understand better. You know, so we're looking at, okay, how does the robot kind of, explain to people that, look, this is the ideal place where you should sit and the ideal kind of volume level or, you know, how, how do we shape the interaction, but in a gentle, graceful way, you know, kind of to, to get people to go into the zone where the system functions well. So it's interesting when you guys were talking about explainability, my mind went there, like, I, I'm like, that's, that's, I guess, some sort of explainability, some sort of like, here's where I am, you know, uh, and this is something we, we humans, again, do um, often and also unselfconsciously. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, we, we were able to, um, it's, it's interesting. Um, we have, because we have this kind of black box model problem, you know, it's hard to, to it's, it's unsatisfying in some sense, I have to say, this, this kind of uh, the research, a lot of the research that we do when we don't have a good understanding or explanation of what's going on underneath the covers. So I, I really think that that's something that, you know, in, in both of our work, we want to pursue uh, going forward. Um, we can get hints here and there as an example. One of the things we've discovered is that what identifies your playing style often ends up being the slight mistakes that you make, not the obvious mm. mistakes, like the big blunders, they call them blunders in chess, or the really good moves you make, but it's the slight inaccuracies that tend to be more distinguishing mm. of uh, one player to another. That's an example of something we've done. Um, we can also map people to some space like we've been able to map players and their games in some embedding space, high dimensional space and say, you're very similar to this person or, or your games are very similar to this person's games or these two games are very similar. But what does that mean? And we really have to unpack that a little better. So we can do a lot of things constructively, but then I think we actually need to deconstruct them. You know, if I can use that word, um, you know, <laughs> overloaded use of that word, but we need to deconstruct the constructions we've made and try to convert those into explanations um, that's something I definitely want to do uh, more work on going forward. Can each of you talk through the different types of models that you are using, the different types of data, the relative complexity of the the setups? I think part of you know what we're gathering here is that each of your projects, correct me if I'm wrong, is kind of a portfolio. It's a research portfolio as opposed to a specific system. Uh, but I'd love to, you know, make this more concrete by talking about, you know, the different things that you're exploring. Uh, Dan, you want to start us Sure. Off? Uh, yeah. So um, the models themselves, you know, the, the, so as I mentioned before, there's issues of representation, inference and control, right? On the inference side, right? On the perception side, 
uh, we do use machine learning models. Um, they're multimodal in nature often, right? Like, and uh, usually when you fuse multiple modalities or information coming from different modalities, you know, they get better. Um, the, the types of models we use are sometimes really simple, actually, you know, like, you know, simple random forest or logistic regression or not even in this deep learning space, you know, although there's a lot of research in, in uh, deep sort of multimodal learning. Um, and, um, the other set of kind of models we, we use and we often struggle with are more like the control models uh, or decision-making models where you need to kind of balance various courses of actions, you know, uh, under uncertainty and also under time constraints. Like, um, and so I think it's not so much for me in the, in the specific technique, like, you know, do I use this particular kind of, you know, machine learning technique It's more in the problem formulation, um, mm -hmm. you know, or how, uh, you know, we build models, for instance, where the system reasons about the, the, the time elapsed in its internal computations, because we need to be very fast and fluid, you know, and so, so you need to even reason about how much time will this take for me to compute or to think about so that I can take the right action. And so I think those are the interesting bits to me where you get to a um, sort of novel ways of sort of bringing in, you know, value of information approaches and, you know, uh, kind of thinking about uh, how can you make decisions under uh, latency constraints and, and under uncertainty? But a lot of the models we use are, you know, from a machine learning perspective, um, relatively straightforward and simple. Uh, most of the work, I think, is in the representations. Mm -hmm. How about you, Sid? Yeah, so the networks we have built on are similar to the ones used by um, DeepMind in their AlphaZero work, their famous AlphaZero work, and which has been open sourced in an engine called Leela. And so these are deep neural networks. They have residual layers, convolutional layers. They have residual connections, sorry, between these layers. So they're pretty deep and complex neural networks. But um, what we've used, what we've done is we've taken that architecture. So the same kind of brains that are used to learn optimal chess play and using the same kind of brain network to instead predict human play and predict mm -hmm. what humans are going to do. So um, we did have to tweak and, and, and change the networks a little bit, especially near the inputs and the outputs. But for the, for the most part, we can reuse a lot of that brain and uh, just redirect it by changing the question. Again, this is a question of formulation. Formulate the problem differently, ask a different question, and you might be able to use the same brain to answer that question. Because obviously what this brain has been able to do, this I'm calling it a brain, but you know, it's this neural network architecture has been able to do is learn chess really well. And I do think that you need to know chess pretty well in order to understand what a human is going to do or what a particular student is going to do. Um, but you don't necessarily have to know how to play the game optimally to do that. As we know, right? There's an interesting question, right? We know that coaches aren't always the best at playing those games. Um, like a great coach is not necessarily a fantastic player themselves, mm -hmm. um, but they're usually a good player or they, they usually have a, a decent amount of experience. So, um, so yeah, that's basically what we've we've been focusing on so far is basically using deep neural networks, um, including existing ones that have already been used to, to, you know, to train engines that play very well, and just repurposing them by asking a different question or optimizing them in a different direction. And are you reusing the architecture, or is there a transfer learning esque type of approach where you can pre-train? or you're taking a pre-trained model that knows how to play chess really well and applying existing you know, weights and, and training to the problem of uh, that you're trying to solve. Yeah, there's a transfer learning dimension. So we, we do train the original um, network um, that was, let's say, used in AlphaZero or in the open source Leela version to train the initial Maya models. But then after that point, once we've trained, let's say, a model for a particular player rating level, we then can take that network and fine tune it with games made, played by an individual player to learn a personalized model. So we do take that initial network, we freeze some parts of it. There are a lot of different ways to do uh, transfer learning and to do fine tuning. So we freeze some parts of the network, we let other parts of it evolve still, and we then supply it with data from an individual's games. And then we can take the base model and specialize it to each individual person, as long as we have enough games um, um, played by you. And you know what is enough? really has varied and we've been you know looking at this data problem um, quite deeply as well too but you know 5,000 games are great 10,000 even better if you've played a decent number of games we can then kind of fine-tune these base models to to the individuals so yeah there is an element of fine-tuning that we do as well got it got it 
Um, Dan, share a little bit about where you see the, the space going, both in terms of your individual research and more broadly. Yeah, I'm, I mean, as I mentioned, like I'm, I'm super excited. I think we have, we really have a tremendous opportunity, I think in the next, I don't know, maybe 10 years, 20 years um, to, to really create new experiences and new modes by which, you know, we interact with computing systems where they meet us more in the physical world, right? Uh, obviously, there's a whole space of, you know, robots and robotics. You already see robots being deployed in hospitals, taking supplies from room A to room B. You know, I think we're going to see more and more of those systems at times goes, um, goes by. Perception is getting better and better. Sensors are getting cheaper. Um, so I think there's interesting opportunities in that space. Uh, I think there's interesting opportunities in terms of applications in um, sort of intelligent spaces and buildings, you know, whether it's a factory floor that automatically detects hazardous conditions or whether we're um, you know enabling more independent living for the aging population with sensors that kind of monitor and understand what's going on um, I, I, I think there's a lot of opportunities in that space and finally another space that really excites me is the augmented mixed reality space uh, mm -hmm. where we we kind of peek a bit over the horizon maybe these devices are not yet you know consumer, you know, great, but but if you peek over the horizon, you can kind of see this world where we will have sort of uh, virtual artifacts overlaid on our physical world. And there's really interesting questions about how do we design those in a human centric way, you know, um, in, in a way that blends with our physical reality. Uh, how do we uh, how do we create those experiences uh, while putting the human at the center. So I think there's a lot of sort of a lot to be done in this space. In the particular space of language interaction, I think again, we've made a lot of progress in the last 10 years, you know, in a lot of the core, if you want, perceptual tasks. But I think we have more integrative work ahead of us where we need to bring together more of these technologies, you know, you're starting to see already sort of more of this multimodal space growing, you know, uh, visual question answering, people starting to put vision and, and, and audio together. And so I think um, there's a lot of more to be done in that space in bringing together different kinds of AI technologies into systems that work kind of end to end um, in real time, like in, in, a, in a fluid way. Um, so I'm excited about it. I, I, I think there's um, there's a lot of potential. Hmm. Can you give an example of in the mixed or augmented reality uh, space that you mentioned how this human centricity um, comes into play or plays out? Yeah, I mean it's it's you know so if if I have things overlaid in my visual field of view, you know, as mm -hmm. I work on something, um, you know, and uh, someone walks into the room and uh, walks through my windows that I'm working in, you mm -hmm. know, well, how do my windows need to move to adjust socially to what else happens in my physical mm -hmm. space? I don't know. Is that a good idea? Is it a bad idea? Yeah. You know, um, how might we construct an educational experience? You know, I was thinking the other day. I, I was, uh, you know, as a kid, I was very much into physics. And so how am I, I construct an education experience where, where it's a tutoring, like, you know, going back to what Sid was talking about, where, where machines can help tutor or, or educate. Uh, how am I, I construct an experience where I see the forces visualized on objects in the room? Uh, and uh, how do I build a tutoring experience based on that, that, that kind of really understands about where my attention is and what I'm interested in and drawn into and so on. So I, I think there's there's a lot of potential. I don't know, people and people get very creative. And so uh, I expect to see a lot more on that. I, I guess from my research and technology standpoint, I'm, I'm, I have this deep conviction that machines need to really understand us as social beings. Um, you know, there's not one user interacting with one computer. We're a world of people that are, you know, embodied and that do things with each other. And I think developing these technologies will enable all sorts of interesting kind of ways of interaction in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about you, Sid? What are you excited about? You know, when I hear about Dan talking about these kind of situations that humans put themselves in, I really am amazed at how amazing humans are, I guess, uh, and yeah. what they're able to do. It I really is. You know, I, and I thought I could hide in my world of chess. And then the moment I start thinking about, OK, now how do I get a teacher to help a student? All of a sudden, it just opens up this kind of worms, all the issues that Dan is talking about the cues, the learning styles, and he worked, you know, he liked physics. He maybe he thought spatially and he learned better spatially. You know, can, can my teacher learn to do that? You know, so what humans are able to do um, as teachers or as just individuals interacting with each other is really amazing. So, you know, going forward, my, 
my goal is to try to find the right kind of hybrid solutions. I really believe in that, uh, that kind of world. And I, oftentimes I write hybrid H-A-I-B-R-I-D, where the H is for human and the AI is you know, for AI. I, I, I really do believe that there is a good synergy to be had here. And I want to understand what AI is good at, what humans are good at, and how they can come together. So this is something that I don't really see in a lot of the work that, in a lot of the fields that I've worked in. I often see one kind of replacing the other. There's some kind of competition between them. Um, not so much of a synergy. And so I, I do believe that going forward, if we're able to achieve what we set out to do, let's say in this small domain of chess, maybe it might be an instructive example of how um, AI and humans can interact in a more productive way, in a more synergistic way. And I hope to try to apply that to other settings as well. Um, it doesn't have to be other games. It can be more complex situations. It can be uh, medical settings. It can be settings where you're, you know, you know, where you're, you're driving cars, or you're, dri you're using kind of smart devices and smart engines, but you're trying to do it in a way that works synergistically. And I think, um, so, you know, I really am looking forward to trying to paint this hybrid picture a little bit more clearly between uh, and understand the right balance and synergy, and also think about um, the safety involved in that. And this is something that mm -hmm. comes up all the time, I think. And I imagine this comes up a lot in Dan's uh, work and situations as well, is how to, how to create a safe environment, how to guarantee safety, how to make people feel comfortable when they're using these AI engines. In chess, it's a very, I can give you a very simple, uh, very safe example. Um, you know, in chess, we can talk about safe moves, what we were talking about earlier. Like I, have, I advise you to do something, but it's too complicated and you lose the game. Mm -hmm. But the cost is that you lost the game. I mean, in others, in more complex applications in real life, the cost can be much greater. Um, so we're looking a lot into safety and this is something I want to think about kind of going forward as well. Awesome, awesome. Well, Sid, Dan, it's been a pleasure chatting with both of you and learning about your research. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you. This is great. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. I had a lot of fun. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.